Hello and uh, welcome to Cheshire Audio. Now uh, today, sitting in the, in the small demonstration room, only because it's a very comfortable chair in here, uh, probably the most, most comfortable chair in the shop actually, um, and as this is a retro review with no product to show, I'm going to be trying to do it with, with photographs, um, so let's, let's, let's find a comfortable chair, because I'm, be, yeah, I'm going to be sitting here all the way through it. Um, could be tricky, we'll just see how it goes, I'm interested in the comments to see if, if people think this one, this one works. Um, okay, let's get on to what I want to talk about. Um, now speakers, I mean I've got a few sort of favourite speakers that are sort of stick out from years past. Uh, not necessarily really high end, but just designs that I just had a bit of magic about them that were really, you know, something special, something unexpected even really. Um, and the one I want to talk about today is the Allison 6. Now Allison were an American company, uh, founded by Roy Allison. And, uh, and he started out, I think he, was, he, was, he had a lot to do with acoustic research, I think, uh, from before they were bought out by Teledyne and, and afterwards. I think he was, a, um, I'm not sure that he was a designer, but he worked, for, he worked for, for acoustic research and then later formed his own company, which were Alison Speakers. Um, and you can sort of see that there is, a, there is a definite family resemblance between acoustic research and Alison. The thing about Allison is, um, their designs were actually quite radical, they were very unusual. Um, I mean, speaker cabinets, to a, probably a lesser extent than a listening room, but it, it is there. The listening room, it, it's not a great idea, it's not ideal to have um, flat surfaces or equal dimensions or anything that, where there can be a reflection sort of off one wall onto another wall and equal distances and all this sort of thing. So the worst possible room you can have is a cube. Um, and you'll find with some, some speaker designs that they'll actually have one, one side that should be slight, got a slope on it or there'll be a, a rounded back or something like that and it all helps with the internal acoustics of the speaker because we don't want the, the energy from the back of the bass unit firing straight back at it as a reflection because that can cause all sorts of untold sort of colorations or whatever. Now the Allison 6 um, is a cube, it's like a one, a one foot cube, um, no high technology on the face of it, very basic looking paper drivers um, and also you know, the other thing with the speaker is that you would generally on the front face of it you'd have the treble unit and the bass unit sort of aligned with each other, some, some manufacturers go to great pains to make sure there's a time alignment factor going on here. Sometimes they curve the fronts around so that the, the treble and the bass and all the mid-range units or whatever are all in a, an arc pointing at you to, because of time alignment. alignment. Um, and you tend to have them as close as it possibly can together so that you don't get any sort of issues with it with imagery. Um, Allison 6, bass unit on the top, treble unit at the front. Completely breaks all the rules. But I could say probably the, one of the best speakers I think I've ever experienced really. Um, and they weren't expensive and the, the Allison range, um, the, the 6 was the, the cheapest model. Um, I know there was, we used to sell the 6 and the 7 but never did the other models. But they did, there was the 1 and the 3, I think the, was it the 1 or the 3 was a corner speaker, big, big floor standing design which was triangular and would sit up in a corner. Uh, so like I say, very radical stuff. Um, what I'll do now, I'll do, a, I'll do a quick cut actually, just to show you um, the relationship with acoustic research because the, I actually, I've actually i actually got a pair of acoustic research speakers here and the, the drivers in that are very, very similar to Allison. So I'll do a quick cut down to that. You will have seen these before. These are my, these are my AR18s that I use in the workshop. Uh, and you can notice the paper, paper travel unit, um, the inverted dome in the centre. Um, and the 8-inch paper base unit, which I've reconed very badly. I uh, replaced all the um, foam surround on these uh, a few years ago and um, kind of rushed it really. So I mean, I've done much, I've done them much better than that in the past, but typically my own pair, I've never made a right botch of. But anyway, they work. Well, that sounds really good. But yeah, the, the Allison, um, very, very similar trouble unit to this. And base unit, probably identical to actually. But the yeah the trouble is much more of a pronounced uh, dimple in the middle on the Allison, um, which I have got a photograph and I'll um, I'll post that up at the side now just to show you in that little area there. Okay, so back to 
back to the small dining room. Yeah, the system I had with uh, with Alison's were I had a pair of sixes very late on uh, in the to the life. I mean, they actually stopped. Alison stopped as a company in 1990, I think, and I was dealing with Alison in the UK. I mean, they, they didn't really they didn't really import them into the UK very. I think there was a sort of a early on they've been imported. Then they sort of disappeared out of the UK, and then they were brought back in again towards the end of the, the life of the, of, the, of the company really. Um, like I say, we just did the, the sixes which were the cubes. Well, this is when I worked at Braders in Liverpool, we had the, you know, the six cube and the seven was kind of the same driver configuration but in a floor standing version of it, which was actually quite unusual at the time because floor standers didn't really exist then. All speakers would stand on a stand, but Alison sevens had the spikes in the bottom of the cabinet and you just stood it on the floor and it, they were sort of you know, the height of, well, how high would they be? About eight, 80 centimetres or so, 90 centimetres tall. So quite unusual, quite an unusual thing. But what I quite liked about them, Rick, was that they had, well, really liked about them, was that they had a tremendous uh, imagery, sort of, sort of a big presentation of sound. Um, tremendous bass extension as well, from a, like I say, one cube box, and possibly the most realistic bass I've ever heard from a speaker, really, and I've, obviously I've heard some quite major stuff over the years. Um, but this huge, huge soundstage and very, very linear bass uh, output from them. Um, the bass unit is very like the Air 18 bass unit, all the ones, you know, the, 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 the drivers that you'd, uh, Kiss Research used in the 18 and the 28, I think. Um, the paper cone versions, not the later BX versions, which were polypropylene, but the, the, the original paper ones. And the treble unit was very, which I'll, in the course I'll have shown you, um, very like the acoustic research one, but a more of a dome, really, much more of an inverted paper cone dome. So you got tremendous dispersion, dispersion of it. And I think that's sort of partly the reason they had such good imagery. Um, I mean, at the time, it was very much the Lynn name thing, and imagery wasn't important. It was pitch and timing and and dynamics and all this sort of thing, but the Allisons kind of did that as well. It was probably a little bit slow by comparison to some things, but you didn't really notice it. If you put a nice chunky amplifier onto them, it sort of that could keep a grip of them, then it, yeah. And there's nothing out there um, that really sort of quite creates that effect nowadays. There's, there isn't a modern equivalent of the, the Allison 6. I have a feeling also that the Crossover wise, they probably were the same as the ARs, where the, the bass unit would be direct driven and the treble unit would just have a capacitor on it, like a little, I think, AR 18 or 5 microfarad capacitor, which just chops the bass signal out of the treble feed. So the treble is just, it just, just gets everything above about 2 kilohertz, I think. It probably, you know, probably everything above 2 kilohertz, I think. Um, and the bass unit does everything else and just tails off naturally at either end. Um, probably if you put them on a, you know, probably if you measured the, the response of them, they probably had a big, probably a big peak somewhere in the midband, but that might be why you got the big sound stage. Uh, you didn't, you, you didn't listen to them thinking these are, uncut, these are coloured, they just sounded very real. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Alice and CD6. I mean, it's, if I find a really good pair second hand, I'm very tempted to try and pick some up, because I, I had mine, um, Quite a few years, I think one of the f when I bought my first house, I had a pair of Alison CD6s and used them with a Dawson DC35, which I'll do a quick cut and show you that because there's one downstairs. Yeah, this is my uh, Dawson DC35, which I haven't uh, haven't used for some time. Needs needs to be recommissioned, really. Um, but yeah, this is um, I, I did wonder about doing a retro review on this actually, but it's. I don't think there was more than about 10 or 15 of them ever made. It was a, a chap called Doug Dawson who turned up at uh, Brady's once and uh, he was manufacturing these these amplifiers that are roughly based on, if you look at the, the sides here, but roughly based on two quad twos, I think. Um, really, really good though. I mean, at the time it was a better than a, an Audio Research, um, whichever whichever one it was, the 60, the 60 watt Audio Research. It was, a, it was a better sounding amp than that, um, but off about a fifth of the price. So. Yeah, good times, good times. So uh, back upstairs, back, back to the den room. Uh, with a Rose pre-amplifier. Uh, yeah, Dawson DC35 DC with a Rose pre-amplifier. I think the turntable I had was a Sondek Echos. 
and one of the better moving coils from Autoform, but I can't remember which one it was, it was the Quasar Quattro. There was a range that was Quasar Quattro and another one beginning with Q, and it was whichever was the best one of those I had, which was really nice, really like that system. And possibly that's one of the best setups I've ever had. Uh, strange, not the most expensive or the most sort of known, you know, sort of, you know accepted known good systems, but I mean, I've had stuff that should have theoretically been a lot better than that, than that but um, that was probably the most enjoyable hi-fi system I've ever owned, which would have been late 80s, I think, something like that, late 80s, early 90s, because uh, I had those CD60s after, after Allison went as a company. Um, I believe Roy Allison died a few years ago, but he'd, he'd been still working, after Allison, the speakers finished, he was still working with other brands, still sort of acting as a um, sort of a mentor to other brands in some ways. So, um, no, he's a clever chap, I've never met him, never met him, it's an American based company, never, never, met, never met him. Um, so yeah, there you go, that's Allison's, Allison's speakers. Um, to give a bit of credit, photos I've taken, I've sort of found on the internet, not easy to find out who they, to attribute them to, because it's just, just random pictures that have come up. Um, I suspect one of the pictures might be, might be a picture I took years ago that seems to come back into the, um, back, sort of, I found back again. I think it might even be the pair, a, a second hand pair that I uh, repaired at one point. So, not sure whether that's what that is, but anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, because I'm going to start spouting even more about about Alison speakers um if you like what if you like what you're seeing uh, don't forget to subscribe and give us a like um let me know if you think this works as an idea uh, it's a difficult one i mean i've, I've got a few more things coming uh, on the retro reviews side uh, which i have actually got the products to show again there will be a few things that i haven't got to show which you know there's quite a few that things i can't ignore really i think yeah it's one of those things. If you get if you get a group of hi-fi dealers sitting around a table, I'm trying to recreate that. Oh, do you remember the that sort of thing? Because um, do that a lot. Do that. Do do that a lot. And you know, a few of my customers who've been in it in hi-fi for a long, long time. It's certain products over the years that you think, yeah, fantastic. So there you go. I'll uh, I'll end it there because I'm going on far too long. Um, I'm going to sit back and have a bit of a snooze in this chair now because it is actually incredibly comfortable. So, yeah, I'll see you soon. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye for now.